Hi, I'm Rob Vanstone. Welcome to the 78th edition of the Ride and Rumblings video podcast. I'm here with my uh, fine colleague, Murray McCormick, Leader Post's venerable football scribe. Uh, each week we uh, pick a rider uniform number that corresponds uh, with the number of the podcast. So, uh, 78, 1981 CFL Rookie of the Year, Vince Goldsmith, Big comes number. immediately to mind. So, uh, I think there's a couple of issues that are first and foremost are pretty uh, resonating with Rough Rider fans right now. One is free agency. The league has just released the official list of free agents. No real surprise there compared to what was reported on or speculated about. And there's also speculation concerning the future of Stephen McAdoo as a Riders offensive coordinator. And uh, I'd be interested in your insights in both. We haven't had a chance to chat with you about about uh, either, at least in, in depth. Um, first off, what's your, ta- what's your take on Stephen McAdoo? I know there's a divided opinions on this. Well, at one time in this podcast, we were probably championing Stephen McAdoo as being potential head coach, head coaching material. And with all the changes that are going on in the CFL right now, there doesn't appear to be a lot of interest in Stephen McAdoo. At least his name hasn't come up. So maybe that's a reflective of what happened in that West final where the uh, Riders offense was less than effective in the, inside the uh, red zone. Uh He's getting criticized, and rightfully so, for that game, but I think you have to take a look at his larger body of work for the season. And as you so eloquently put the other day, I think it's worthy of him being re-signed, which isn't the popular way. But I think, uh, you know, Cody Fajardo excelled under him, and I think we really have to look at it. We have to look at what the receivers did under him. They had a 1,000-yard rusher under him, a 1,300-yard rusher. The offense, they had more touchdowns than, I can't forget off the top of my head how many touchdowns they had. 43. 43. 43. 25 the year before. So is that, that's an improvement. I mean, it, in had, the big, to, it, in it the, had to improve. In the biggest game of the year, something was lacking. Some, he, somehow he didn't have the confidence in William Powell to give him the ball in those goal line stands. And But on the other tone, that's a pretty good defensive. I think we got to give the Blue Bombers a little bit of credit. That's a pretty good defensive line. They had, I think they had a defensive a goal line or a third down stop in the Grey Cup game. I think I'm pretty sure. Or a couple, a couple. So you know, obviously, when Craig Adams said, or Craig Dickinson said that, you know, they got a lot of respect for their 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 goal line, their short yardage. They probably had too much respect for them yeah, to the they, point that it totally altered yeah. their strategy. But you know, Winnipeg, you know, the the proofs in the pudding with Winnipeg. They beat the three best teams in the league on route to winning the Grey Cup, and maybe uh, they deserve a little more credit than less criticism towards Stephen McAdoo. Well, I don't know if you think. What do you think of that? Well, I, I think he should return. I'm not certain that he will. If no. there is to be a major change on the Ryder coaching staff, that would be, the, I think, the most likely one. To what extent does the Rough Rider to, does the Riders co, does, does Craig Dickinson attach more weight to the body of work or to that that West Final? Um, if you perform well, if you're a singer and you just knock them dead at Casino Rama, but then you bomb at Carnegie Hall, does it matter that you, you that for three yeah. weeks you were really good at Casino Rama? Uh, that's uh, that's the thing they've got away. I was I was also curious and intrigued by last week's edition of CFL Wired on TSN, and they showed Cody Fajardo coming off the field after that quarterback. Well, it wasn't a sneak. Whatever it was they were trying to do where he got <laughs> flattened for a loss of one on third and third and goal from the one. And he came off the field and, and said quite audibly, I hate that play and suggested that a sneak, I can only infer that it was just the straight ahead version would have been preferable. Now, is that just one play in the heat of the moment that he was dissatisfied with or does that evince a larger dissatisfaction? Uh how much do you read into that one play? How much do you read into that one game? Exactly. So how much does that one play? I hated that call too. I think you have the, you know, that, I don't know if that's as bad as that one with Brian Bennett and William Powell banged into each other. There were shotgun. two really bad ones. Those are really bad plays too. I think that one was a stinker from, from the word go and didn't. I still don't understand, and I know where, why Brian Bennett was in the game in that situation. I watched, I told you, I think I mentioned, Brian Bennett's warming up. And I said, why yeah. is Brian Bennett warming up? And he warmed up for quite a while. So it's almost as if they were preparing for that eventuality in the fourth quarter. I still don't quite get with what was going on with that play. But, you know, do you want to have your first-year starting quarterback go into a second year with another offensive coordinator, with a new offensive coordinator? He probably hasn't had the same one in his career. It's short enough. But he's but never had this much responsibility. No. So do you look at – 
what the impact is on Corey, on Cody before you make this move. And obviously, Steve Walsh has had a big impact on him as the quarterbacks coach. But do you get Cody's input? Does he like yeah. you know, maybe? And does, does Cody's that, input reflect that one play yeah. that was captured on CFL Wire? That's that's such a small microcosm. Yeah. But but Cody's never been critical of anything. Yeah. You know that seems so fun, but. You know the mic doesn't lie. That's that's yeah. a, that's the beauty of CFL. Water. Only on our podcast. <laughs> I, I remember two years ago when Duran Carter was losing it on the sideline in that East final. Remember that one? Then CFL Wired caught him on that. Remember Duran Carter, folks? He played for the Riders, and that was insightful into how bad you know Duran Carter was frustrated. He was tired. He wanted to be used and all this stuff, and it came out on CFL Wired after. So we kind of got a sense of that, but. I I don't know. It's not the pop. We can probably sit here and gain a whole lot more support if we said fire Stephen McAdoo. Oh, absolutely. Let's go on. But I think take the season as a thirteen and five season. The increase in offense, the development of Cody Fajardo and Isaac Harker and Brian Bennett as quarterbacks, an offensive line that turned out to be pretty good considering it was in up and there were so many changes to it. As I said, the running back, the receiving core. There's going to be a lot of changes. You know, there's 32 names on this list, 33, I think, because one's missing, and I'll mention that. But, uh, you know, how many how many more changes can you take? But, but can, he, can, can Stephen McAdoo deliver in the big game? That is a question. Did it in 15. Did it in 15, but is as with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, can he deliver in the big game? Uh, they're 0-2. Uh, they've, lost, they're, they've had home playoff games the last two years, and they've lost them to Winnipeg. The play calling. Now, you, get, you give Stephen McAdoo a bit of a mulligan – on the twenty in the twenty eighteen game because he didn't have a starting quarterback. Yeah. But there were still some calls in that game that, that were mystifying. Brandon Bridge is finally moving the ball and they remove him and put in David, David Watford, Watford and right. And they did the same sort of thing. Cody Fajardo was on a roll. They take him out him out. In comes Brian Bennett. One pretty good play and then absolute chaos. So can he deliver in the big game? Uh the offense in the twenty seventeen East Division final was not Tremendous. No, uh, they uh, riders. The, the go-ahead touchdown was scored on a punt return by by Christian Jones uh, yeah. against Ottawa the week before. Decent and Marcus Thigpen ran wild against Ottawa. So in, in the playoffs, the pedigree hasn't been that good as a Saskatchewan Rough Rider for Stephen McAdoo, and that's the big. That's one of the biggest home games in Rider history. Yeah. That they just. Absolutely. So that's the question. Can where the, they blew the opportunity. That's the question. Can the writers move forward with with Stephen McAdoo? That you know, we can all look back on which body of work is produced. Now, do we put on our, our you know, try to be, be predictors and what can they move? Can this offense move forward with the, Cody Fajardo having a whole season to whole off season to digest and to learn what he's going to do? Come into training camp is the number one guy without any questions or any and all that stuff and. With Stephen McAdoo and Stephen Walsh and those guys helping him, I think they can. I think they can take a step forward in the de- on the offensively. But the same token, I know it's hard not to look back and say, "Yeah, well, Stephen, you got to do better than this." And when do they get into this? If they get into that spot again with another home game, because I think it only gets you know, the stakes only get higher next year with the Great Cup. Here. Yeah, but I, I kind of like Jeremy O'Day's statement the other day, and I've, I've mentioned that many times. The Riders try to win the Great Cup every year. Yeah, there's just because it's here. Makes it more fun for fans. But there's media. more pressure, too. There's pressure, but the expectations. And, 13, and people remember what happened in 13. And 13, and we watched what Brendan, Brendan Tamman did. And I still forget, don't forget, he signed Dominic Picard and Brendan Labatt in 2012. Two huge signings on that offensive line. Yeah. And that, and then he got all the... Oh, and they brought in Corey Sheets that year. Yes. And they signed Taj Smith that year. So they brought in all these guys with an eye toward... And and Xavier then, Fulton in 2012. Yeah, so. and then 13. So we, he got so they had the foundation in 12 to do that. I don't know if there's a foundation as much here other than they have a starting quarterback. And you and I can probably – maybe that goes back to 13. They've had a healthy starting quarterback going into the next season in 14 when Durant came off the Greek Cup. He was a starting quarterback of 14, and we saw how the injuries have just sort of gone from there and sort of uh, hurt them every year at quarterback. So maybe this year I have a starting – I just have to mention a little bit about torn oblique muscles. My daughter is a volleyball player, and she had – oblique issues in, the, in her career and it's one of the things I'm not saying it does come back it you it, it's one of those injuries where it can surface again and torn oblique muscles when I did that story on Steve Balland from the Huskies and he mentioned to me at the time Steve Balland Steve Balland sorry 
I can write it better than I can say it. Uh, there's scar tissue to deal with because that happens when you tear something. So they have to break up that scar tissue too. So Jeremy O'Day says it's rest and recovery is that, but there's also going to be some rehab involved there. And I, I don't know how much scar tissue there is or what, what involves it, but it hurts because you're tearing away scar tissue. So he's, it's, he's going to be back, in how he's, but he's still going to have some issues with it, I think, that are maybe not going to be like overwhelming and all that stuff, but it's still an injury he's got to recover from that he played through within one of the gutsy performances. And unfortunately, in a loss, it doesn't become as gutsy if it's, that's possible. It's still admirable and still courageous. tremendous. Tremendous, but still in a loss, eh? A loss doesn't lead itself to, you know, st- books being written about him. Oh, thank you. Or another chapter in Rough Riders history about playing with two torn obliques. So he's going to have some work to do in the offseason. He's going to have to get healed, and then he's going to have to bring it back. To, so, and I, I know there was a lot of uh, joking a little while back about Dak Prestock from the uh, – Cowboys warming up and doing all these strange motions. And it turned out he was warming up his obliques, which you don't see very often. So maybe we'll see Cody Fajardo Fajardo next year doing those weird palpitations of his body and trying to get his obliques warmed up to throw the football and do all the things he's capable of doing. One thing about 2013 going into 2012, going into 2013, Riders lose the playoff game in Calgary, not the fault of the offense. Darian Durant threw for 429 and four touchdowns, the touchdown to Greg Carr in the final minute. It was the defense that blew it there, the long pass to Romby Bryant for the touchdown. Uh, and, they ch- and they changed offensive coordinators after 2012. In comes yeah. George Cortez replacing Bob Dice, and George Cortez was masterful in 2013. So that's not to say yeah. that if they make a change in offensive coordinator that it can't be successful, but you better make sure there's a George Cortez out there yeah. if you do make that change. And to what extent are you encumbered by the coach's salary cap or the coach's uh, yeah, the salary management system as, as it pertains to the – the coaches and can you can you just you can't write up have a blank check to bring in yeah. the best offensive coordinator you can find. I I would tend to think that some stability is is warranted there, but and even who are the offensive coordinators out there that you don't know, like? Yeah, Paul Lap Police is the one the, the big yeah, name, but he's going to become head, the, the top offensive coordinators. The next step for them is to become yeah, a head and coach. not a lateral move to Saskatchewan yeah. to be to work in this market and stuff like. And even the worst thing going to happen to Paul Lap Police is going to stay with the Bombers, which isn't a bad yeah. life. He lives in Winnipeg. His family's yeah. there. He's, and, and wait Tommy, till that perfect job comes along. Yeah. And Tommy Condell, another guy with the uh, the Tiger Cats. Worst life, it's not a bad life going back to the Tiger Cats. So I think those guys have options. I don't think a lateral move is going to be the very best. Nor would it probably be allowed. No, I don't think they'd allow him to so. talk to him. So, you know, th- I think there's a lot of things being made about McAdoo, and rightfully so, and I think it's, but I, you know, kind of move on a little bit. And I think until the riders. It's interesting, in the old days, they would never announce anything about coaches, eh? They just kind of disappear in the off season, and then they come out with this list of coaches somewhere yeah. before the season started. Oh, so he's not back. He's not back. But now, the other day, Calgary released their receivers coach and announced that he's gone, yeah. which is kind of an interesting twist. A cap on, casualty. Cap, cap casualty. Exactly. A really well respected coach. And so. maybe he's available, but you know, maybe the guys are breaking back. And I think we got to take a look at that with the Riders. If it's quick. Jason Shivers, he's a must re-sign. I know I don't know if they have two year contracts. Usually coordinators have two year contracts, but we don't know. So he's a he's a must re-sign or keep whatever they gotta do. I think they gotta keep Dickinson as a special teams coach. Do you think maybe they should promote Terry Eiser to that role and maybe get Craig to be more of a the head coach? They've overseeing? gotta find they've gotta find a way to make sure that game management is is yeah. better. Especially at the end of the first half. There were four instances where of this year where the strategy was questionable, usually re- relating to the use of timeouts and, or, and or Craig lack mentioned that, And Craig mentioned those, a couple of those. He was working on special team stuff. Yeah. And that Terry Islam, that's a, <clears throat> pardon me, that's a, that's a logical candidate to assume some more responsibility because you've got to be, the, the, you've got to manage the game. You can't let those things happen. Yeah. And if it happens once, fine. Uh, and he's very apologetic about it. He's very forthcoming. But it happened too many times over the course of the yeah, season. And so in that last game, and in, in that last game, that uh, you know, the, those points would have come in handy if they'd uh, been a little bit more judicious, or could have come in handy if they'd been a little more judicious with their use of timeouts. But let's give Jason Shivers credit too for that yeah. defense. It, the best defense in the league, and I think I'm going back to the Bombers was the Bombers. I think, and the absolute in their last three games, they were dominant. Yeah, even in the last six or seven, they carried that team through some. Some questionable, co- not questionable, eight quarterback injuries. Willie Jefferson wasn't the monster he was, but 
Until the gray come to that was two plays that stand out for me and defensively for for Willie Jefferson. He gets the roughing the penalty, roughing the passer penalty, and then comes on the very next play and gets that strip sack and a turnover. Yeah. And I, I was watching with my dear mother and I said, watch out for Willie on this play. And I don't know why I said it, but he just had the play. And I thought, among all the other things that happened, that was a huge turning point because it was their second turnover and their second second or third possession. I can't. We, I said I was watching with my mom who talked the whole time through the game. So my. Level of concentration wasn't as high as I thought it would be, but that was a I'm big I'm not sure play. the Tiger Cats were concentrating either. The, the Tiger Cats, man, that was a bad game for them. Right from the word go, Evans looked like the guy that says, okay, maybe don't let Joe, don't, re, don't let the re-signing of Jeremiah Mazzoli be, sorry, maybe the loss of Jeremiah Mazzoli isn't a sure thing yet. I think they saw that Dwayne Evans against a well-coached, well-prepared defense isn't quite ready to step up yet. Yeah, they just weren't up to the moment. No, none of the that. moments. And I hate that when you say that because you have all year to prepare for that moment. From the day they get in training camp to they get the, it's about the Grey Cup. And it builds and it builds and it builds. And you should know it's the biggest moment of the year. And the Hamilton team just wasn't ready for it. But Winnipeg, it was like they were playing for their lives for a yep. number of weeks. And they were playing through all sorts of adversity and all sorts of uncertainty. And even if you look at the Andrew Harris situation, yep. and it seemed that there's, there were a lot of forces aligned against them, and it seemed to galvanize them and, and uh, in some ways make them a little ornerier to play. Oh, ornery. And, <laughs> and so they come in, and they've had to go through some wars to get to the Grey Cup. And Hamilton had a considerably, considerably easier route to it. They had to beat a Jason yep. Moss coach team in the East Final. Without really but they having, still went, they still went having, 15 of 18 games, with, Rob. But they, were, you know, they, didn't have that, they didn't need to have that playoff edge late yeah. in the year. It was pretty much obvious at Labor Day that they were going to be the first place team in the East. So they weren't playing those type of, those high stakes games that Winnipeg played week after week after week leading up to the Grey Cup. And I think maybe Winnipeg was just the... Was it 89 the Riders came from third? Yes. That was the only time they And in 97 as well. They didn't win that year, but... Because that's... Uh, you know, that's a pretty big accomplishment. I don't think that's, well, we said it. Edmonton did it in 05. It's, yeah. it's happened a few times. But it's, you know, they go on the road. So they beat the three best teams on the road in the league. So give Winnipeg more and more credit. I think as we more look back on this Winnipeg team, sure, we saw the quarterback issues. We saw the everything else going on. But, you know, Carl Walters is out there and gets some Zach Claris. Big trade, huge trade. And what does he do? He leads and goes 4-0, and and they win the Great Cup with yeah. Zach Claris. And you and I, we also we always have well, only in the CFL moment. But Zach Claris is an actual only in the CFL. Moment. I don't know if that could happen in the NFL if if a guy could catch on to this system. But I don't think he was as dominant in the Great Cup game as he had been. But no. he was effective. Yeah, and he just and didn't he, get the team in trouble. No, he didn't. And you look at Dane Evans in the in the miscues early. That That's, never happened with with Zach Claros. And he was smart enough. And uh, Paul Epley's give the ball to Andrew Harris, and we can discuss. Should he have been playing in that game? Absolutely. He served his punishment. His punishment, based under the CFL rules, he was suspended for two games. He's allowed out. Now, do they need to look ahead to that, that your guys who test positive for PEDs shouldn't be allowed in the playoffs? I think baseball does that. They, aren't, they can't go into the playoffs. Maybe that's an additional penalty on it. But under the current rules, he did nothing wrong except go out there and play with a gigantic chip the size of a 2 by 4 and... I've said this before. I love watching Andrew Harris play. I think he's tough. He's fast. He's he's aggressive. He's just does everything right on the field. And you go, man, that's that's why he should. Without the PEDs, you know, we still don't know if that's causes or what the effects are. But he had a game, and the, he was named the MVP and the Canadian, rightfully so, with an asterisk because can you get those awards without having this PED in his past? We don't know, but. You know, you, you take a player like Andrew Harris and you give him some motivation, I think he's just proved that he's probably one of the best. He is the best running back in the league right now. Oh, there's no there's no doubt of, about no. that. Um, Most valuable Canadian, too, is pretty cool. That's the yeah. first time it's ever happened. I guess. Well, I mean, Russ Jackson would have won them yeah, both in they haven't had them. if they had the award. Yeah. Tony Gabriel should have won it in 1979. If they'd had both awards, Tony Gabriel would have gotten Most Outstanding Canadian. And I just want to, I know, I know you wrote about it in your column that. Uh, Cody Fajardo looked like he had a little fun at the Great Cup, eh? Did he ever? Did what? A, you know, and I think just threw himself into, into Ryderville. Yeah. It was you know, amazing. And know Darian Durant would do the same thing, but not quite. Maybe because social media is even bigger now, and there's more selfies, and there's even more yeah. than that. But 
Cody just went there and had a blast. And that's, that's cool to see. That yeah. that's Cody did that. And I think, you know, Rick Foley coming back and Rob Bag coming back. To, I wasn't there, but I saw on, on Twitter and stuff these guys. How could you in. not see it on Twitter? Yeah, That no. was the whole timeline on Friday. Yeah, so Cody good. Fajardo and everybody. Now, I, I don't know how you feel he's finished second as an MOP. I voted for Brandon Banks. I think Brandon Banks. I think I did. I hope I did. Uh, Brandon Banks, I know you can discuss. Cody does so much more. I think Brandon Banks was the best player in the league. He showed that in the East Final. Didn't show that in the Great Cup. Well, team. six catches for 72 yards till he got hurt. Until he got hurt. And he got it. That was a pretty serious injury. Like that, He's talking sports hernia, I think, a big lump. And Cameron Judge finishing second. We kind of knew it was going to be Henock. And coach of the year, you know, you win 15, 18 games. You do everything you did with Orlando. It's funny, though, know, between Orlando and Craig Dickinson. Orlando. The, the, Orlando. Uh, Orlando's in Florida. I know, I've done that. But the, the, how, the parallels on their seasons, too, like losing both their quarterbacks, coming back through adversity, first-year coaches, players love them. You know, there was really a tough call on that one, but I think – Winning 15 to And I know it's East Division a little easier, but they still beat the teams in the West. Yeah, but they have, they played more of their games against the West than the East. Yeah, so so they got had to do that. But Free agents. Um, oh. You're much more up on this than I am. There's 32, and you hinted at maybe 33. Well, for some reason, Charleston Hughes' name's not on the list. Hmm. And I reached out to the league to find out why. And uh, he signed a two-year deal when he played when he, when they got traded here in 2018. It doesn't say his name's on the list. So that's... Did uh, he quietly sign an extension? Maybe, but, you know, we didn't know he wasn't really talking to us on uh, Garbage Bag <laughs> Day, so we didn't find out what was going on. And um, it could be, a no, it could be a no, and I hate to raise this because we won't be able to answer this on the podcast, but that's the one name that jumped off of it. And there's questions in Winnipeg about whether is is there is not Matt Nichols a free agent. I think Darren Bombing tweeted about that yeah, earlier like today. The, so the list... I'm not quite sure how the league generates it. You would like to think it gets triple checked before they send it out. But I, I can't remember there was a year past where another significant name was left off the list and the league added it later. So I just, but it is a, uh, you know, I think it's easier to list the guys who are coming back. Yeah. <laughs> as I go. remember once upon a time a CFL active roster consisted of 32 players. Yeah. Now that's the list of free agents. Um, and, and you look at this, and we'll just touch on the guys who are coming <clears> back Cody Fajardo, William Powell. L.J. McCray, Kyron Moore did sign a three-year deal. That was I saw some reports of two-year deals, so he did sign a three-year deal. And I've just drawn another. Brendan Labatt ben, is, Brendan back. Labatt is uh, back. Zach Evans. Zach Evans. Um, um, Blushez Purifoy has resigned, resigned now. That's a big resign. I think that's a big resign. Underrated and underappreciated, I think. Uh, Not Kobe Cofield is under contract. No, nope, Kobe Cofield is on the list. I thought he signed a multi-year deal. No, last year. That's nope. interesting. So that's um, another one on the list. Uh, the ones on the list that are Sha- Shaq Evans. Just, I'm not sure that's an NFL possibility. I, not, not He's 29, 29. Years, 29 years old next year. In one super season. Mine, JWL, J- J- Jordan Williams Lambert kind of took his one big season into an NFL trials and didn't really accomplish yeah. much. Another guy who comes back. Uh, Naaman Roosevelt, another key contributor, a little older, I think 34. 32 now. 32? Okay, or 32 next season. 32 next only, season. Only lots of clutch catches this year. Great on second down. Only one touchdown. Yeah, that's a. That's a big sign. And, uh, you know, more of them with receivers, I guess. Those are the big ones. Uh, uh, Manny Arsenal is, Manny is on Arsenal. that list. Do you bring back another character guy? I guess if he comes back for the right amount. You know, they've got to address the age issue on their receiving yes. core. Next year, Manny Arsenal is 33 by the time the season is over. Corey Watson is 36. And and uh, David Roosevelt is 32. And it's funny, Jeremy uh, O'Day brought up Patrick Lavoie on yesterday's press conference, mentioning he had a back injury almost from day one of training camp, and he had back surgery and came back to play in the West Final, and he didn't rule out Patrick Lavoie coming back. But he's another older guy that's kind of running. What about the offensive line? That gets interesting. Well, Dan Clark is one, and I don't think that's going to be a very tough igno- negotiation. They're going to say Dan, or Dan's going to say this is what I want. They're going to say this is what we got, and Dan will sign. I don't think that's going to be any doubt. Yeah, what a, congratulations to Dan Clark on being an All-Canadian. Yes, When amazing. you consider what how that was looking in May. Uh, and that's, then, yeah, that's awesome. And O'Day went into that a little bit about having his hip drained and stuff, and it was a tough battle back, but... Watch what you're doing on gravel roads, I guess, is that the ad now on SGI is pay attention on gravel roads out there. But they, uh, who is signed on the offensive line aside from... Um, signed or... Aside, because Shepley and Labatt have signed, so signed. that leaves Bladick. Bladick's on gone. The list. No, Bladick's on, Bladick's on the list. Cofield's on the list. Uh, Phillip, Thaddeus Coleman. Philip Blake. Thaddeus Coleman. And they've got some age issues there, too. Yeah. I mean, Thaddeus Coleman is, is, is in his mid-30s. 
Yeah. Uh, Dan Dan Clark will be 32 next year. That's not old for an offensive no. lineman. Brendan Labatt will be 34. Uh, Philip Blake will be 34. And Blattick's still a young guy, but I don't think he was very happy with the way the season ended, getting benched. I, I'm not benched. I don't know. Maybe benched. Also, no, bench, circumstances bench, change. Benched makes it sound punitive. Yeah. Suddenly, Brendan Labatt comes back. And, and Philip Blake and comes Phillip back. And Philip Blake comes yeah. back. That's... I mean, Dakota Shepley ended up being relegated as a result yeah. of that. Cody, Cody, Dakota Shepley is going to be a, a tremendous player for a, so they, a decade. They have some depth. They have you know some guys to address there. And they've, there's got to be some guy who cries across the league that maybe they can add as an offensive lineman. I haven't had a chance to look at the other guys' list. because Quarterback, uh, they don't have any worries there. No, but uh, that's the two guys I under thought Brian Bennett was a, a one-year deal, but I guess they signed with the more. But, I mean, is there even room for a Brian, Brian Bennett on the roster next year with the two quarterbacks? Well, you can – uh, the way I understand how it's going to work, that's on the active roster. You can still have three. One guy's on the practice roster. Yeah. So Jeremy Day did another a pretty decent way of explaining it last night. I tried to said that you can still have the guy practicing. It's, does he develop? Does he develop on the sideline holding the clipboard in a game? How much development is there, and how much time will he play now? How many times is the third string quarterback the short yardage quarterback? Many many times. Yeah. You and I've seen that more often than not. The third string quarterback is your short yardage quarterback. Yeah. And the second string guy is holding the clipboard. So, but they're still, so they're trying to say, and I'm not, what I'm guessing is they say there's more development on the practice roster. We can use that spot on the main For roster. another player from overseas who isn't going to play. Exactly. <laughs> so it's Sorry, not, there's another tangent. <laughs> uh, on the off- on defensive line, we have uh, Mac Henry. You know, he's another older player, but got more effective than, I think, than Zach Evans down the stretch. I think he kind of outplayed. Yeah, it. we don't know how how hurt Zach was. Uh, Micah Johnson's one. He's a free agent after this year. And yeah, he's certainly not going to get two hundred fifty grand again. No, this year. he didn't. But you know, he may come back for less. Yeah, and I think you know maybe he can regain that form where he had fourteen sacks in the year before. But he's another one guy. You know, we kept watching, and I guess you know you kept watching. We kept trying to find ways to explain how his effect his effect in this was. But maybe he was just, and he was, I think. He was a better player in the second half than the first half. Yeah, and he, he said that. He was kind of slower to start. Uh, A.C. Leonard, you know, second on sacks with nine, I think, this yeah, year. Yeah, and so, played really well down the stretch. And, you know, he's a guy, he's another guy with a huge chip on his shoulder trying to prove that he can do things. And I think he's. Charleston like, Hughes is the interesting one. Is he, yeah. is he not a free yes. agent? And if he is. And he's 35. So here's a thought I have Charleston Hughes is 35, Willie Jefferson is 28. Eight. So he's a free agent. Seven years difference. Willie Jefferson has said he's happy in Winnipeg. He wants to come back, but I, I dare you to find a player. To quote John Foley from uh, J.R. Foley from Stampede Wrestling, money talks, Mr. Whalen. Money talks. And, you know, does he want to come back here? And does, you know, I, I was going to say before you. Uh, does so he, re- is, was he, was he lowballed here? Is there some, yeah, is there some lingering resentment over the way the contractual situation was handled this past February? So maybe, maybe, but. Do you, what an upgrade that would be. Maybe take the Micah Johnson money, Charleston Hughes money, and throw Willie Jefferson at Willie Jefferson. And, boy, that's, that proves a lot. kind of makes the defensive line strong again. Yeah. But as, Hard to imagine not staying, him not staying in Winnipeg, though. I don't know why. And that's, you know, as you said, money talks. But sometimes you've got to just make the decision that's right. His, uh, one thing that happened to Willie Johnson, just Willie Jefferson at the banjo ball, his wife and his daughter came up from the States to join him, to stay with him full time. And he said, what a difference that makes. And that's... Sometimes that a little thing, little thing, an important thing like that can make a huge impact. Not that it did in the second half of the season because he cooled off, but I still think that having some comfort and having his daughter there around and probably made life a little easier, a little less stressful for Willie. What uh, about the linebackers? Uh, linebackers, well, boy. That's an interesting uh, one. Which, uh, yeah, Cameron Judge. That's probably the biggest position of concern. Yeah, Cameron Judge, Solly, uh, Solomon agency. Aluminium. Is Aluminium. One, Aluminium. I have to get you on that one again. He's one of those guys. He's older too, 30, 33. Moncrief may may be NFL bound at yeah. least for a trial. I, I, at the first half of the season, I said absolutely. Now, now not as much. Cameron Judge is going to get a sniff or two, and I. But it's still, he's like an Alex Singleton, I think. Well, maybe not as good as Singleton, but I think Cameron Judge showed he can play in this league and can develop. He's only twenty four, you know. Maybe the NFL because you can't fault a guy for wanting to go to the NFL, no. and I will never ever say something bad. You shouldn't go. Just I don't, don't care go if to you're twenty nine years old as Shaq Evans. If an NFL team gives you a call, get your butt down there and do it because that's that's where you got to be. If you're not trying to be in the NFL, well, I guess you're happy in the CFL. But I think everyone, should, all these American guys, should be striving to be in the NFL. So uh, another defensive back is Ed Ganey. He's 
he's he's resigned since he's been here, and I think he's going to be back. He's another. Yeah. I don't think he had his best season. I think it was uh, solid. I think he's a leader, and he kind of does those kind of things defensively. And Nick Marshall is another one. There's a young yeah. guy who could possibly turn it around, could down to the NFL. He's one of those guys sniffing at that kind of start. And good for Nick. He's a guy, though, with a goal. Does he end up in Cleveland? <laughs> If they go to the two-man quarterback system, Nick March becomes even more valuable because he's a quarterback. Maybe he's a short yardage quarterback yeah, like he, he was can, in 2018. Exactly. Yeah. So there's a good, that. a a good point. point to have Nick can do that, fill that role. And so if you're a defensive back out there, and I know you're all in international defensive backs are watching Ryder Rumblings, if you can play quarterback, take a look at the CFL because the way that this rule change goes through, it's going to be a little different. I think there may be opportunities for – guys to get an opportunity to be that backup quarterback and be a starter on defense or the other way around. We did mention running backs. Uh, William Powell's under contract yeah. for another year. Marcus He's thinks 32 things. next year. Yeah, um, but he didn't look. Well, He's other than being still good utilized back. at times. I think they got to find a way. What they said the offense was going to be and how what it evolved into were two different things. I thought William Powell, given the way they had – Talked about the offense is going to be a fourteen or fifteen hundred hundred yard back. But still got thirteen hundred. Not not much. Uh, was it thirteen hundred? About eleven. Eleven. Oh, was, sorry. So, Andrew Harris had thirteen hundred. So, uh, but he so had still, still a good year. Twelve, 12 touchdowns. touchdowns. <laughs> but uh, he, he wasn't the focal point that I think a lot of people expected. Do you think they can do that? Like even even Winnipeg with, as I said, the best running back in the league still threw the ball, still turned the focus when they needed to to to. Uh, Chris Trevler. And, and Cody Fajardo took a lot of the yeah. running off of, just to handle a lot of the running as a well. A little quick point. Do you think I, since Ovechkin winning the Stanley Cup, and that was just a, the party after was amazing. I don't think too many guys had more fun than Chris Trevler at the Great Cup winning it. That was not was the not fur coat. The sh- and, and I heard the other day, and I read this the other day, that he was getting, he went up to Richard, he was getting guys to sign his body. <laughs> they said, Do you want to sign the front or the back? And it, it was pretty ripped. Like he's not, he's not, doesn't look like us. He's got these, these bumps on his stomach that go in, I think, kind of muscly. And it, but just seeing him in that fur coat and just watching him thinking, yeah, you know, that's a guy having fun. And there's nothing wrong with Some people were critical, you know, act like you're not going, no way. This is a once in a lifetime thing. You get so it. many chances to win, so many few chances. And I, I loved every time I watched it. And just like Ovechkin from doing keg stands to jumping into ponds to. Everything like that was so much fun to you know, appreciate. We'll, we'll, we'll see how it evolves uh, in June when Blake Wheeler is the captain of the Stanley Cup winning. I hope there's, I hope there's two parades in Winnipeg within the next calendar year. So we didn't talk about special teams. Well, uh, uh, John Ryan's available. And so is Jorgen Hughes, which a little quick. Jorgen Hughes got moved from field goal snapping to punt, just separate punting now, so which is kind of a strange one. I think John Ryan just supposedly liked Alexander Gagne's Delivery a little better, which I don't. Who knows? We don't. But, but John Ryan's available, and uh, he's a hundred thousand a year guy. Great punting average. Nets was mediocre, but you that, bring John Ryan back. I think he does. But does John Ryan want to come back? Uh, I, 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 garbage bag day was an interesting. I know we're talking about this a little bit, but uh, none of the players are available. They were all gone by the time we got in. So all the guys you really want to talk to, which is traditionally the time you get a sense of what's happening in the offseason. Because you don't do that during the playoffs. It's yeah. You can, but it's kind of bad form to ask. Like, you know, you got the Great Cup game with the West Final. And you know what the answer you're going to you know, get. I'm coming uh, back. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, tr- I'm only focusing on Sunday. And sometimes it's a cliche, but at that point in the yeah. season, there's – there's no way. any question about anything other than the than the looming playoff game. Is can you imagine if a, a player of drama says, well, "I don't want to come back here"? Yeah. Oh well, there's the story of the day. You so. can ask it, but they're not going to yeah. they're not going to so answer it. But I, I think and there was should. never that opportunity because there was such a sparse gathering on Garbage Bag Day, and yeah. and there still hasn't been you know for example, there's been so much talk about Stephen McAdoo. Nobody's had the opportunity to ask Stephen McAdoo specifically yeah. about why did you do that and give Stephen. So. I don't, and he would have, he and he's always been very forthcoming yeah. and and faced the music when he's had to. And I, that's what I was going to bring but up. There the was no uh, there was no availability no, was with Stephen McAdoo post. We're kind of left, and even with the Cody Fajardo thing, where I would have asked about his his the rehab and what's he going to do to prepare. Because I think, do they owe it to us? Yeah, I think not. Just I'm not saying old talking to the media. No, it's the fans it's who the don't. Fans. Know. Those are your customers. Like we're our conduits, and they're your your people. And because Cody Fajardo didn't talk. Which goes in a bit of a tradition of the starting quarterbacks not being available. Well, that's two years in a row. Zach yeah. Kalaros wasn't available. I know, and, before. and Brandon Bridge. Brandon came Bridge in. answered all the questions. So I know that's Darian always. Darian was always. Yeah, he didn't like it. Didn't like it. But I, I don't like dealing with me some days either. But he answered yeah. all the questions. So that was a 
So what do you think this month will be like, Rob? Do you have any thoughts on it? I, I think it's going to be pretty quiet in Ryderville other than that. Well, I think there's there's got to be some urgency with regard to figuring out the coaching staff mm -hmm. because all those – you look at the, the turnover around the league. We don't know what's happening in in Toronto yet, but yeah. Ottawa's looking for a head coach. BC's looking for a head coach. Edmonton is. So um, – and who knows what happens with Tommy Condell in Hamilton? Who knows what happens with Paul Lapolis in Winnipeg? So there's, there's going to be some moving pieces, and it will probably have probably happen pretty quickly. So I think there's they've got to get their coaching staff nailed down pretty fast. Yeah, that's about the only thing I could see of some. Because if they're going to address happening. free aside agents. from some selective free agent signings, like I wonder, they probably how, got some players signed. I wonder how many of these contracts are in Jer Jeremy O'Day's drawer right yeah, now. Yeah, pull pull them out of the drawer January first when they're no longer. The long, long, long so I'm going to throw one at you here to, to make you think a little bit. I don't like doing Back that. on the season, now it's over and done with, long gone. Give me a highlight. Cody Fajardo. Yeah. I mean, it's, it will be remembered as the season of Cody Fajardo. And just seeing a franchise quarterback emerge. And, you know, I'm extremely old. And there haven't been a lot of them over time where you've seen this young or semi-young. 27 isn't like yeah. he's right out of college. But this, this quarterback come out of nowhere and just take over. Yeah. I've never seen anybody become such a presence so quickly. Uh, I'd heard all about Glenn Dobbs and had a chance to interview Glenn Dobbs twice late in his life and quickly understood why he was so revered because he was such a nice, nice man. And Cody Fajardo seems to have every one of those traits. Yeah. So his, the emergence of this franchise quarterback, not dissimilar to Darian Durant, in uh, in uh, 2000 and well parts of 2008 certainly in 2009 uh Kent Austin from the 89 Grey Cup onward you knew he was the guy yeah uh etc Ron Lancaster beginning probably with the 1963 playoff game against Calgary uh you don't they don't come along very often where there's a young quarterback who just takes over yeah. and 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 we've talked so much about free agency he's one of the exceptions he's signed for for two more years now. So long after people have forgotten what happened in the West final, I think people are going to be remembering what Cody Fajardo did. And it's only this season was probably just a launching pad for yeah. him. I think you're talking about a player that once his career is done, is going to be remembered as a, as a beloved rough rider. Cause and this of, was the start of it. It's interesting. One of my highlights, and I wasn't there because I was out the day when they announced his resigning, and I said, man, does that show a guy with maturity, shows a guy with foresight, shows the riders with the foresight to see that, to sign a two-year yeah. deal. When they could have waited, he could have waited to see what happened. He, he could have probably could have wring more money out and, of somebody. And there was also, I know when, we did, when, he, when he told people why he was staying to, same with his number, yeah. that was a, a sign that, I went, boy, this guy's mature. He's way more mature than I am. Yeah. And I could, uh, a low light for me, and I think it's going to, I know it's kind of weird, but that rain out game in Montreal, I know that all of a sudden, they come up with these rules that they have a weather protocol and all that stuff, and the game stops. And you know, 20 minutes later, the weather's cleared, and they could have played it. Yeah, that didn't make anybody that, look good. That didn't. Uh, that was a low light for me. Where well, there's two of them: the second <laughs> second down from the one and a half yard line against Winnipeg yeah. in the West Final, and whatever it was uh, with Bennett, and with Bennett, with Brian Bennett colliding with William Powell, and then the third, the second and one that becomes a third and two. Yeah. So the 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 uh, it probably takes us full circle to the topic with which we began podcast number seventy eight. But that yeah. that play calling uh, at, at crucial junctures in one of the f only the third West Final I've ever seen in Regina. Yeah. So, and that's going to resonate for. Should a while. we hype ourselves? Can I do my little hype now? Sure. I did the Great Cup fit up one hundred consecutive days of exercise of thirty to forty five minutes. I completed it on Saturday before the Great Cup under some Rob knows some pretty tough conditions. I feel better for it. I had a lot of support from a lot of people, a lot of encouragement, including you. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun being part of a community to do something like that. When you put yourself out there, you got to get out there. Yeah, absolutely. So I think congratulations that, on thank that. Thank you. That was and tremendous, uh, and I hope to I hope to follow up on that <laughs> well we'll get together and we'll call it uh great cup fit up 2020 and we'll start working out together again yeah i'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll enjoy spending even and more time you with got me your book and you've been you did book. a signing last night what, yeah. what's what's the reaction from people when you're signing are they saying who's did you wear well, they're that they're very happy to meet my wife did you wear that same blue jacket and red tie? no i wore this uh really fashion conscious oh, good uh, ensemble oh, that's you nice uh, i i did uh signing at, at mcnally robinson booksellers in saskatoon on on uh 
Wednesday night. Date know. night in the Vanstone family? We, we had a nice long drive up to Saskatoon <laughs> and a nice long drive and conversation back. So um, there was another one coming up on Thursday night, as in November 28th, um, the 43rd anniversary of the Tony Gabriel catch. Uh, that'll really spur attendance. Um, 7 p.m. at Indigo uh, in Regina tonight. My wife will be there too to save the day, as will my sainted So where mother. can people find this book now? Do you have any ideas? You can ideas? find it at Indigo in Regina and at uh, in McNally Robinson in, in Saskatoon. And I just There's uh, a lot of copies up there. I can attest to that. And also on Amazon. So uh, feel free to drop by if you have an opportunity tonight. Even if you're not buying a book, it'd be nice just to say hello and Talk a little football. We don't need to read that. This I know. Week I was going to take this and scrunch it up. Where is the shredder? This is our shredder. final, our final podcast in terms of doing it. Unless on a something happens between basis. now and Christmas. Sorry. We're just going to react to events uh, as warranted during the off season. Yeah. Um, I if think there's a big announcement. Big announcement in Ryderville. We'll certainly be on that with a podcast uh, right away, sort of episodically, as opposed to having a fixed schedule looking back we had some good guests we had craig reynolds we had jeremy o'day uh luke mullinder was outstanding Derek taylor Derek taylor was really good Derek was right about Kalaros island yeah he entered that on his first appearance yeah. in the podcast and Derek taylor's uh opinion of zach Kalaros was certainly vindicated not in the manner that i think people expected or Derek had expected back in april or may but uh yeah uh, who knows? Who knew that he would win a Grey Cup with Winnipeg? So yeah. um, we had some good guests, and I think we did. Hope we entertained and maybe informed a little bit, but heavy on the entertainment and yeah, light on the we're informant. still too heavy, Mur. <laughs> so there'll be more fit ups to come. Yes. Thank you so much for being with us uh, so often this year. We really appreciate uh, the time you spent with us and the, and the feedback, etc. And uh, we won't be strangers as the winter, hopefully inexorably, uh, reaches. Uh, plots its path to a conclusion and we can see springtime again and, and uh, the 2020 season which promises Great to be home. Great that's Cup at Home cool. that's going to be a, that's going to be a lot of fun so for Murray McCormick uh, Mark Melnichuk our producer I'd like to thank Mark and Austin uh, Davis stepped in uh, as a when, fine when, little backup quarterback when we sit here and talk endlessly we leave the room and, and go on to write but Mark has to edit this and put in all the add all the little little frills that make this more watchable than it probably should be. So Mark Melnichuk and to Austin Davis, uh, who also produced some episodes, thank you. But especially to you, uh, thanks for the time you spent with us. Hope you have a great holiday season, and we'll do this again in 2020, if not sooner. So for Murray, for Mark, for Austin, for everybody at the Leader Post, take care, and have a good one.